Good afternoon all. I'd like to welcome you all today, 25th of July, to the Forum Scrutiny Committee on Facing Corporates. Um, we've received no apologies at the moment. Have we got any declarations of interest? Apologies, I've got to read this out first as we're online. This scrutiny committee is being conducted hybrid in accordance with the core virus regulations and remote meetings protocol, agreed by the council, which will operate alongside the council standing orders to ensure that we continue to take democratic decisions in an open and transparent manner. I would remind members that this meeting is being live streamed to the public. Can I request you all switch off your cameras and mute your microphones when you are not speaking to ensure there is no unnecessary background noise and to help with the audio and visual quality of the broadcasts. The Council standing orders and the Code of Conduct will apply at all times during this virtual meeting in the same way as ordinary meetings and members should conduct themselves accordingly. Can I also remind members to ensure their chat function is switched on and to use that facility to indicate to me when they wish to speak on a particular item. Please do not speak until I invite you to do so. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, going back to the agenda, um, is there any declarations of interest in any items? I'll take that as a no. Right, I'd like to go through the minutes of the next of the last meeting which is the 11th of July, 22. <clears throat> Page two, any comments or queries? Sorry, that was page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. And page seven. <laughs> like to ask the committee who would like to pass the minutes and a seconder. to invite uh, Tracy Kim to speak on the service review, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, councillors. If I introduce uh, myself and my colleagues. Um, a bit of a strange year because I'm introducing the People and Business Change Service Plan. And for most of that year, I wasn't the head of service. Um, the strategic director was Chris Cornwall, but I'll present the plan today. And we're also in a service that's changing, so you'll see my typing is different. So we're reporting on some services that will actually sit elsewhere in future. So I'll try and cover that as I go. We've also got my colleague, Kevin Harold, who's the interim HR manager, and Mark Lazard, who's the digital <coughs> services manager. Between us all, then we'll cover any questions you have. So in the pack, we're on page 18, I think it is. Um, and also on top of those changes, a strange year due to COVID. So a lot of the work we did was COVID support work and I'll cover a little bit of that as well. So last year we were responsible for a range of services. We had five cabinet members. The lead cabinet member uh, is now Dimitri Petruni, who's online today. Um, but actually last year there was a change of portfolio, so we had more, more and different cabinet members last year. The service is actually an underpin to all other services. We provide the HR, the organisational development, the digital, the IT. We previously provided civil contingencies uh, and cohesion and equalities work, policy and planning. So as you can imagine, a lot of those services really affected by COVID and the whole of the service really geared up around the COVID response. We provided for the whole year the civil contingency support and planning. The health and safety team we did all of the risk assessments and all of that uh, COVID work alongside their, their other work, of course. 
Uh, we saw staff move to a new way of working, as we all are today, using laptops, working from home, huge HR shifts and technical shifts during that year, led by Mark and his team. We led a range of work on participatory budgeting, which is outlined in the plan where we supported communities to bid for funds to do work that would support them in the future. That was going to happen anyway, but it changed slightly due to COVID and we changed the, the nuance around that. Um, we need on the development of performance and risk framework. So we are actually responsible for all of these plans, what they look like, the shape of reporting, the systems behind that. So the service is responsible for that also. And uh, during the year, we developed the climate change plan, the local area energy plan for Newport that you may have seen in other papers. We work to the strategic equalities plan and we produce an annual report for that, the Welsh language annual report. We will produce the council's annual report and we did the same last year. So kind of a lot of compliance reports and a lot of the things you see on cabinet agendas would be um, part of our teams. We work closely with a number of partners, but particularly the Shared Resource Service to provide IT. So councillors will know we don't provide our own IT anymore, but we work really closely with those partners. And through that, we also control the council's information risk and um, all, all aspects of information governance. We also provide all scanning, um, mail, printing provision across the council. So all of that would have happened last year. Last year, we were also responsible for community cohesion. That will be moving to a new service next year, but is reported in this report. I won't go through all aspects of the report, but I'm trying to give you a sense of the service. What you'll see through the report is the major programmes there were around the new normal and moving staff into that new way of working and the, the production of things like the climate change plan and the local area energy plan. We've just started uh, a new project to redesign the council's corporate website and we'll be expected to report more on that next year and we're also doing quite a few information um, transitions including the land and registry work and i'll perhaps pause there and take questions chair rather than go to everyone yes thank you any questions members to the head i'm going to Councillor Riggs, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, initially just wanted to look at the uh, what safeguards are in place for um, for people uh, sort of that are working uh, hybrid and, and remotely, safeguard in terms of their well-being, but also the safety of, of data. And if you've had any feedback from the staff that have been sort of working under these conditions, uh, sort of good, bad, or in, indifferent uh, from them, but more so it's about the the, the safety of the data and, and their well-being. Thanks. Yeah, that's really important. So uh, we do have feedback both. Um, I don't know if we lost the council. Are you still there? Yeah. Sorry. Um, we do have feedback both um, from the beginning of the pandemic and more recently. And what we do know is that um, people were much less happy when they had no choice but to work from home. I mean, obviously, that was a really challenging period. Um, now, as you see, the Civic Centre is more open and other offices, so individual members of staff who find it more difficult to work from home can come in or don't have suitable accommodation can come in and work. Um, we're keen to make sure the social aspect of that and um, making sure teams can continue to work together. We've, we've got a number of programmes around that and wellbeing at work programmes. In terms of information governance, um, in many ways, not much change. The technology and the infrastructure in place, so we have a virtual private network and all access to information is through that network. That is the same if I'm sat in this room or I'm sat at home technically, so all of our transactions are protected. We do need people to be more careful members of staff to be more careful with things like waste or note taking or being overheard or how we dispose of um, paper that we may may have used of course and we now have headsets so that uh, uh, everyone can obviously be not heard if they wish 
We also move quite quickly to a program from a health and safety point of view of individual assessments and issuing chairs or desks if they were required or two screens, keyboards, laptop risers and so on. So a lot of work has happened, but I would say we probably have further to go and we need to keep working on that. We have an employee partnership forum with the unions, which is due to take place the week next. Uh, we will look at changes to staff policy. So we'll review what does home working look like going forward now. Now, you know, COVID is part of our lives rather than over. Uh, what does that look like in terms of travel expenses and accommodation and so on? So a number of policies still being worked through with the unions that we hope to complete in the next couple of weeks. Anything to add? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Just, just to add a little bit in terms of the, the kind of information security piece. Um, so, so we do provide regular guidance and that's obviously part of our kind of uh, things we do to try and avoid problems. Um, so, so we have provided extra guidance because, because a lot of staff are working from home. So that's just one thing to mention. Another thing to mention, it's not covered in this report, but we we have been implementing a new system. You may have seen some guidance on passwords, because obviously passwords are a crucial part of our kind of protection against cyber, et cetera. So, so yeah, this we have provided guidance and we are, you know, we are implementing a new system to kind of raise awareness further as well. Thank you. How do you deal with sort of data, data destruction? So if I obviously if I'm a home office step out, um, how is that how is me using me as an example, how would how am I supposed to destroy any sensitive information that I have? So I guess the first thing to say is uh, we discourage printing, although I here I am with some printing company. Um, we discourage printing, we encourage people to work on the laptops because the other thing we didn't say is everything is encrypted. So if the laptop was lost or stolen from someone's house, if there's no lost data to speak of, staff don't have printers at home. Um, some members do, I know. And we would encourage staff to return to the civic centre or their nearest place of work to dispose of confidential waste confidentially through those arrangements. But our ideal is less paper. Most most losses are through paper, actually. So is there anywhere in the system which logs if things are printed out? Is, is that built into the software anywhere? We, we, we do everything we, we print goes through a kind of central print queue, if you like, but we, we don't actively monitor that in terms of who, who's printing what we have. We have done that in the past, as it has changed slightly with, with COVID, less, less print has been done. So we don't, we don't print, we're sorry, we don't monitor people who are printing. So could I technically take this laptop and then print to a, a, print, a printer, not a network connected printer, but a standalone printer at home? Um, I would have to check on that. I would, I would hope not. Um, but I would we need to check online in terms of whether that's physically technically possible. I suspect not because it would probably need to install the drive for the print on your device. And I don't think it would allow that, but we would need to double check that. I guess we put a lot of the onus on the person to to be trained, be responsible, because ultimately if you wish to print badly enough, you can print. You could email somewhere else and print from another machine. If you really want to print, you can. So it is really about the person being responsible in the way that they behave or they dispose or they're overheard and, and so on. And, and just, no, I suppose just to add to that, so, you know, we um, is an information governance group. So, so Gareth is the senior information risk owner for the organisation. Um, so Mark runs that operationally. So we take data security very seriously, you know, not a statutory requirement, but, but we have taken an information governance report and it's report through screening arrangements for the last six, seven months. Yes, about nine years. Mm -hmm. About nine years, which details incidents of um, data breaches. Um, that leads to training programs with staff groups. So if there's been a particular series of issues with the service area, we'll instigate more training for those. So we're, we're constantly trying to improve that. I think, you know, from a, from a data security as far as it's in the, in the system and hardware, 
um, you know, we, I think, probably go above and beyond best practice for that. However, we are being updated, which is it's, it's down to an individual individual failure in that. So as Judge Tracy said, we very actively discourage printing, but if somebody does do that, there's not really a lot that you can do about it. But obviously, perhaps actively discourage doing that. I, was, my, I guess my original question was sort of teetering around if people do like the print stuff, I don't know. Um, <coughs> but, but that's just how it a bit old school. Um, and how do they then? Well, I can't say why How do how do they then dispose of that safely? Well, obviously, people have shredders at home, and I everybody does. Um, is there a service, a collection service? Is there is a confidential waste provision on site? Yeah. Does that collect from people's houses? No, they have to. Can I come in here? There is a box in the members' room. Yes. It's put yes. papers in. Okay, we used to have a shredder as well, didn't we? There was a shredder in there, sure. yeah. I just used it. <laughs> so, I guess if I could come in, a lot a lot of what is printed by, by members particularly isn't confident. Like I've got today's report because I've been at the laptop thing and so on, but that's actually a public report. Yeah. So look, I wouldn't put it in my recycling, but it wouldn't matter too much. It is about if you've got a resident, isn't it? It's about if you've got residence information, mm -hmm. we've got residence information name and address and even worse services with mm -hmm. more personal data and we do a lot more intensive work with those services of social care, say, education. Thank you all for that. Councillor Reynolds is waiting to come in. <laughs> uh, well I did have two questions but actually you've answered the one I did have a confidential lease to the Councillor Horton's question so I won't bother that one again. Um, my other question is sort of two-pronged. It's to do with um, Staff well-being and also productivity sort of linked together, really. Um, in terms of productivity, I think mean, those who work in teams, people in office teams, know that a lot of the good ideas and good practice comes from that conversation that you have by being together in the office and obviously all working to track some of that. Um, so I just wondered what mitigating steps you might put in place to try and get the best of both worlds, if you like. Um, and then linked to, to um, staff well-being as well. Um, I know myself when I worked in the civic centre myself. Um, I use myself as, as an example. I had problems with my back and my shoulders, mainly through poor posture over the years. Um, I was able to, able to get occupational health to come in and do a desktop um, assessment for me, and I could make a number of changes, which made that um, help me in a physical way. So I could then obviously help me work. Um, does that facility exist for people working at home in terms of monitoring their workstations? Should I start then? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, really important what you said about working with teams, and I would say we're still working through some of that, but we um, are working really hard to make sure individuals have a check in and once work. Um, there was a period of time where we didn't enforce that during that, those early COVID days, but we've come back to that and we report on that. Um, making sure that there are team meetings, previously wholly online, I would say, but moving towards can some of those be face to face, so getting, getting back to a bit of that. Um, the Civic Centre is not ideal in terms of that hybrid working model. You know, this is quite a good size room, but lots of them aren't. And so we've got some work to do to think about what our future accommodation looks like. Um, but we're working hard with our managers to make sure we're still finding a way of keeping teams together and finding a way for people to interact um, both casually and formally. You know, those team catch ups, as you talk about. Um, in terms of staff well-being and productivity, what we actually see probably is people working too much. And as we, we're more flexible, we need to be careful about people feeling the need to respond at all times of the yeah. day. Um, thanks to our colleagues, the present company also. We all we all need to do more on that and perhaps model more, more of that. However, we are also working towards a more flexible model where people can choose their own hours more than they did before. So there's there's a few challenges in there. In terms of the kind of more physical well-being, um, we have individuals do their own assessments and we've created forms around that and they can 
they can request a desk, a chair, whatever that looks like. If it's more specialist, we then have a service for them. If it's more specialist, again, probably we'd encourage them to be office based. So if you have very specialist equipment, then probably a more suitable base is, is within the office. Um, but we really rethought our whole staff well-being structure during the past year. So this is a bit, bit more of a wrapped um, package and we're also working differently around sickness. So I just want to get uh, to the wellness at work. work. Um, yeah, so I mean, putting aside the staff can log on to the email and also look at the health safety requirements for what kids are able to support them, etc. etc. Also, there's a similar program around managing staff absence and actually being more um, supportive up front rather than waiting for staff members to go up. Well. So, we completely got rid of our management of attendance approach, which was managing, managing all attendance from the main rooms, giving warnings, giving sanctions, sanctions and warning people on the call from state health absences to a wellness at work approach, which is far more proactive. It, it tries to identify potentials up front for people to potentially be going off. Uh, there's a number of steps in there when managers are and well-being check-ins for their staff, as well as their normal one-to-one -one check in where there's a specific facility to manage well-being check-ins around to try and develop um, workplace um, support programs to support them through their, their employment. They, they will move across perhaps if they get a new job in a different area, they move to that area so the manager is pre-warned pre or pre-informed about the, the steps they might need to take coming to there. Um, so the gate is launched in January, so we moved from um, January onwards. So managers have gone through a period of training around managing staff in, in a different way for absence. So in terms of the outcomes of that is in day six months in, seven months in. But already the first review we did um, this month is showing that actually we completed around 100, 100 wellbeing check-ins and we've had a case management discussion where we've prevented people going off. Um, and also, we've managed to progress along the to in absence cases that have been stuck in the mix to a, to a conclusion in the way um, over the last couple of months. Really. Staff work is much more at the forefront, particularly since we you know, the pandemic hit. I was going to say, as a former union rep who fought for years against that sort of punitive approach, and I've been for the proactive approach, so I mean, that's, that's over to you, really. Is. Okay, thank you all for that. Uh, Councillor Thomas, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I mean, obviously, we're really pleased that the needs of our staff and their emotional and physical well-being is, is obviously being considered. But I mean, I think we all as councillors are very aware that, you know, we hear for residents of Newport and things have changed so drastically, you know, since the lockdown, the way that we deliver as, as the council services to our residents, obviously, completely in a different way um, and I'm just wondering you know a lot of our staff will be very aware you know they will get their job satisfaction from their interaction with with residents and I'm wondering how the council are planning and progressing um, you know that nothing is lost in this withdrawal of face-to-face -face services and opportunities for staff to to work directly face to face with with the residents and the council taxpayers in these Yeah, I, I'll be careful not to commit on other people's portfolios because in, in, in our service area, we don't interact as directly um, with members of the public, but we support other people to so do, don't we? So we've worked really hard on things like risk, risk assessments through the, through the pandemic, so from a health and safety point of view, airing towards how can we provide services, how can we stay in touch with people, um, albeit in the, the safest way. So we've always been aware of those needs. Um, and we do what we can to support other service managers who have direct contact with the public. But I, I don't know that I can commit on customer services because it's mm -hmm. not mine always. Well, I, I suppose not, not as not really committed on customer services, but I suppose just to say, just to contextualise it, 
Um, we've got approximately five and a half thousand staff in need of walking, but that is three and a half of those working schools. So they've been working, almost mm -hmm. through the pandemic, they've been working on, on the front line. Um, probably another thousand of the other staff to do the things like social services, social care, civil services staff actively. They work fundamentally as a change of work through the pandemic. There'll be mitigations in place in order to protect them fundamentally from doing that. I think we maxed out at about 1,200 staff working, working from home at any one time. To right. so, okay. so, so actually, they, I, I don't think that the, pa the pandemic has changed the way we delivered certain services because the mitigations we've had have in place is but I don't think it's fundamentally changed the, the difference between face to face or online services. Online services were there, and I think actually probably shifted people's perceptions about the sorts of things you can get online rather than face to face. But you know, most services that were delivering face to face continue to deliver face to face in some fashion during the pandemic and continue to do that now. And the remainder of staff, and let's just come back to that was Reynolds question as well, the remainder of staff are, are not necessarily in a choice situation, but they are working in, in a way where they're at home for part of the week or in the office for part of the week. So um, I think the question around customer, the customer service side of it is it's, it's around the type of customer services that we're providing. So obviously there needs to be a face-to-face -face service because many of our residents yeah. you know, but, are but, unable to access it in other ways. But we have that figure of 1,200 who are working from home at the height of the restrictions, right? Yeah. And yeah. what are we back to now as a... We could run the teams test and, and provide the figures committee, it won't be it won't be anywhere near that. No. That, that's kind of where we, mm. we max out. But you can see the, the building now. We're probably uh, we did an occupancy assessment at the civic centre before the pandemic and I think the most people were, were in the building any one time was during the before. Right, okay. And we're probably up to about two hundred now. Probably, so maybe a bit more than that. So it's not a huge difference. It's a good proportion. Yeah, you know, but those people may be working from home two or three days a week, working in the office two days a week. Mm -hmm. you know, generally, it's that, yeah. that sort of way. I mean, what, what was interesting to hear, Chair, was the head of policy, her people policy and transformation that she said, you know, initially people have been very ha unhappy about being forced to work from home. So, you know, we've got a better balance now, presumably. Yeah, and we were, of course, we were in the lockdown, so the yeah. same empty staff couldn't go anywhere else either, because yeah. you know, there were very few choices, and it was a really challenging mm -hmm. time. And, 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 you know, we were, for some people, working from home wasn't very conducive to their mental well-being. So we were in a pandemic, in a lockdown, which was challenging for people's mental well-being anyway. And you know, if you live in a you know, in shared accommodation or rented accommodation, you've got very little space. Mm -hmm. You know, that is more of a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Or other, you know, mm -hmm. home circumstances. That's more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. than, you know, if, if, if it's your house and you have space and you've got a, a facilities. Mm -hmm. From the authorities' point of view, actually, we did have a caveat in the the all working from home scenario, which was a thing with well being issue. We would we would break the space in the office without those two things. So we try to be as flexible as possible, but you know, it's because it's a challenge for everyone. But the situation at the moment is face-to-face -face services are happening by much likely the fall of the pandemic. We staff can work in a hybrid flexible way they are. And we'd encourage that because that cuts down on CO2 emissions and congestion around the city and actually enables us to, to operate in a slightly different way as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, going back to the end of year review, I'm going to go through the pages. Can members please indicate if you'd like to ask questions? Okay. Page six, page seven, page eight. I did have a question on page eight about the land registry. Is there an update on it? I'm sorry, we want the regulation now or the... It's the data migration, Gareth. All oh, right, okay. Um, yes, I guess it's a, it's a long ongoing 
project to migrate the data in that way. So it was never going to be finished last year. Um, I think we're probably 18 months away from that being finished, but there's more work progressing this year. It's ongoing then. It's ongoing. It is, it is a long to process a national yeah. initiative. It's only because it's 15%. So I thought I'd ask it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Page nine. Page 10, page 11, 12, 13, please stop me if you need to speak, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, can I stop you there, please? Yes, what page yes. would you like? Sorry, um, I'm going by the page numbers down the the, the left-hand side of the page. I wasn't following your, your page numbering system, ah, sorry. I see. Right, so can I take you back to, it's my page 35, oh, which is right. so your, the next page. your reference page 20. Oh, page 20. Your reference, yeah, where you're referencing page 20. Uh, yeah. It's, it's around, my question is around the, uh, the the Brexit task and finish. Uh, Brexit. Yeah, you've got the role, uh, the, the report states the role of the Brexit task and finish group will need to be considered in 22-23. And I just wanted to, to ask um, the, the members there, what's, uh, what strategy in place to, to review the work role of this uh, the Brexit task and, and finish group? Who would like to answer that? Shall I start? Thank you, Councillor. Um, so what we're seeing with what was the Brexit task and finish group is we're seeing Many of the issues we were discussing there have now um, become not quite business as usual, but general risks as a result of other things. So we see some challenges with supplies and services. We see challenges around cost of living. Um, we've since had the um, humanitarian crisis that is Ukraine. And so Brexit, if you like, can no longer be treated in isolation. Uh, the council has a working group for matters relating to the Ukraine and we work on, if you like, the as was Brexit issues as and when they arise and we've agreed to report to cabinet on a set of issues. So instead of trying to disentangle inverted commas Brexit, we are now reporting to cabinet on issues from a range of external factors, which is Ukraine, Brexit, and other post-COVID pressures. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's more sort of wider European approach and sort of wider global approach then. Yeah, because the post-COVID, some of the post-COVID challenges actually are um, not dissimilar. If you if you look at some of the things with supplies and services and um, uh, recruitment and so on, there's a, there's a mixture of issues outside of the council's control that we are seeking to respond to. We also have a corporate risk register and a corporate risk strategy, so we treat each of those risks in line with, with that and we report quarterly on all of those risks as well, of which Brexit is still one. Ms. would you like to come in? Yeah, I suppose Joe, Mr. Tracy has just said. So we made a series of work streams that were identified as, as part of work uh, across WLGA for, for post EU transition. Um, and as Tracy said, it is, you know, at the, there are a series of, of issues and risks associated with, you know, the global economic practice post COVID plus Ukraine. It, 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 you know, what were, what were the Brexit issues are just those global issues now. Um, so they're just, you know, so to reassure you, you know, we're still tracking and responding to a range of issues affecting people across Newport. But to, to wrap that up in something with the word Brexit in is, is almost impossible now. So, so they're, they're interconnected in and, and challenging issues, but they're, you know, they're within the corporate risk register, the research response responses, 
Um, Ukraine is obviously a specific series of issues associated with that at the moment, not only because of the economic issues associated with it, but also Newport's response to that as well, you know, as part of the Homes for Ukraine scheme, plus the super sponsor scheme from Bosch government. So they bring in additional, actually real operational challenges for the, for the local authority as well. Okay, Councillor Ricks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you all. <clears throat> right. Page 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 5, 26, 27, 28. I've got a question to ask on the integration strategy for the asylum seekers and refugees and migrants. Um, is there an update on that? And have we got large number of EU migrants coming to Newport, Chris? Do you want me to try? Um, I suppose a couple, a couple of different bits with this. So, um, obviously, during the EU transition period, there was a lot of support out there for EU nationals around um, settle status applications and that process. Um, so we've got, we had that. Newport is also an asylum dispersal area. So currently there are about 500 um, asylum seekers within housed within Newport as part of the Home Office Asylum Dispersal Scheme. Um, got at various stages through their asylum applications. Um, so we've got that. We've also, obviously, as you know, we've now got um, two schemes through Ukraine. So we've got a Homes, homes for Ukraine scheme, which is individuals saying they are willing to sponsor of uh, uh, an individual or family from Ukraine, plus Welsh Government Super Sponsor Scheme. So we've got those. Plus Newport has been involved in um, the first, the original Afghan Translator Scheme. So if you remember five years ago now, I want to say. Um, there was a, an ask of local authorities to um, provide accommodation and support for um, Afghan families who need support the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan. Plus, um, following the Syrian conflict, the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme, which is previously called the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme, Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme, which is primarily for people from the Bina region, Mediterranean, North Africa region. So we've been involved in both of those for five years, and plus more latterly there was an additional request about Afghanistan after um, the need was brought from Afghanistan. So Newport is involved in all, all of that. So what we're trying to do is bring all that together so we've got a better handle and support on it. Now, asylum to dispersal is, is a home office scheme, it's not involved, that is funded by the home office through um, a variety of organisations, not the local authority. Um, but obviously, it has a knock on effect for, for Newport. Um, some of the other schemes, the funding comes directly from each of the local authority for us to provide support for those, those individuals. So, we're just bringing those things together. It does include complicated things, which I haven't got an answer to the committee today, Chair, around uh, people who fail their asylum uh, application but remain in Newport and then are in a situation where they don't report to public funding. Uh, which is another particular challenge. Uh, perhaps we could talk about another, another day, but you know, it is a, you know, uh, difficult for us to put a figure on how many of those individuals we need for. As a okay, resource, really helpful. We have to yes. provide a service for them. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Ricks. Councillor Briggs, would you like to come in? Uh, coming in on, on page 40, sorry, I jumped one ahead of you there, Chair. I was coming in on page 42, wanted to stop you in advance. Sorry, carry on. Okay, uh, just a, again, question to the, the members. The um, Looking at the performance measures for the 
uh, the national number of apprentices per 1,000 employees. And this again comes back to sort of a initial discussions around COVID. Um, the, the target 2021-22 was 20 per 1,000 employees and, and 20 to 21 was 29 per 1,000 employees, which is, okay, some good figures for the uh, apprentices. But 21 to 22 is when obviously COVID was really um, sort of taking a, a hit and we had 20 there. 21 to 22 actual performance, um, we got with seven uh, apprentices uh, taken on and saying about the, the COVID pandemic resulting in, in delays. But if you look at the 2021 performance, we had 29 apprentices taken on and that, that's really when the, the COVID was, was, um, was, was kicking in more. So really it's just that the question is, um, what's the target going to be looking like for 22, 23? And is this going to be then a realistic uh, target that's, that's going to be achievable where obviously the, the actual performance of 2021 showed the, the target was potentially a little bit unrealistic given the, the, the pandemic we were working through? Thank you, Councillor. We had a number of challenges with, with really key on um, supporting that, uh, that push for apprentices. We, we want to kind of grow our own um, talent and it's really important to us. Uh, we started with, I think it was two apprentice campaigns during that year, but one of them started in that year and concluded this year. So we have since taken on a number of apprentices. Um, we had quite a poor response to um, the, we were at the time, individual departments were recruiting apprentices and that detrimented our response. And so what we've done is we've pulled together all of those opportunities and had a campaign for apprentices, a number of apprentices, and since then we've taken on in the first round, which was around February, March time, we did take on five, but we had actually had like 12 jobs out there and we couldn't get applicants or suitable applicants for the other. So they've gone back out recently, I think they closed this week actually. So there is a potential another six vacancies out there at the moment for four apprentices. Um, plus we're working with service areas to identify within their own um, budgets and resources whether there's scope to, to develop traditional posts into apprentice posts instead where there, there is flexibility in that. So providing your point for this process that closes this week, we will, we will appoint another six uh, hopefully to a variety of different roles across the council from care to admin through to um, uh, start and yeah. various, various departments. So I, I think I, I would close by saying I hope that target is realistic because we're really keen to hit it and we're doing everything we can to hit that mark. Can I say, based on your answer there, that it's, it's good that the council sort of stood back, looked at, OK, maybe that's not the right approach. You've changed the approach and you, it's, sort of, as you say, working collectively, suddenly you're getting a better result. So it's, it's almost good that COVID has done this type of thing uh, to the council to say, how can we work smarter, not harder, as it were? So it's, that, that's good to see. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Riggs. Thank you all. <laughs> page 42, page 43. 44, I'd like to invite Gary Price, please, to give us an overview on the law regulation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a bit like Tracy's service area, uh, last year was a period of transition for, for us, um, not just in terms of the transition in terms of COVID response to the COVID recovery, but in relation to the service area itself. This will be the last time we'll report to you a scrutiny in terms of a composite report for law and regulation. Because obviously as from the 1st of April, following the, uh, the restructure and the realignment of services, then public protection has been lifted and shifted from my service area into environment and public protection. Uh, and Sylvia Gonzalez-Lopez, who's in your head of service, is also on the line. Uh, in case you've got any questions for, for her, but it's probably been unfair to ask her any questions at this stage because uh, she wasn't responsible for performance in the, last, yeah. in the last 12 months. And similarly with cabinet member responsibility, um, you know, in, in future uh, public protection uh, will come under Councillor Clark as the cabinet member for strategic planning, housing uh, and regulatory functions. Uh, which means that what's left then with law and standards, the statutory, the corporate services, 
Uh, that will come under Council Patrimony, which again is on the, the line today, and in relation to corporate services, and then the leader in relation to uh, to democratic services and the democratic process and all things mayoralty. So there's been a bit of a change in terms of roles and responsibilities and, and, and reporting lines over that, that period. So um, hopefully um, the staff in the other parts of the service area will forgive me for focusing uh, more on, on the public protection side of, of, of this, this review for the, for, for the last time really because it's been the public protection service that's been at the forefront of the council's response to the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of the test trace protect service, uh, the environmental health response in terms of, of support for, for care homes and schools throughout the pandemic, and uh, then from the uh, the regulatory point of view, from, from training standards point of view and licensing, in terms of enforcement of, of the various restrictions that have been enforced during that period. So I think in terms of, of the um, the key achievements during that last 12 months, um, the response to COVID and, and the move from, from that COVID response to the COVID recovery phase was probably the most significant achievement uh, throughout the, uh, the service area. Um, I don't normally single out people for, for special mention because all of this is a, is a team effort in terms of, of meeting service plan objectives and the work that's done. But I, I have mentioned one or two people in, in my executive summary in, in the report. Uh, Premier Rhys Thomas, and at one stage was a principal environmental health officer, uh, and then all of a sudden was elevated towards leading the council's response on, on COVID over 18 months, two years. Um, at some stage was, was chairing some very high level uh, incident management team meetings and so on. So special mention for reason because of that, he, he uh, uh, was successful in, in being awarded one of the, uh, the Newport uh, uh, awards uh, in terms of, of, of the recognition for his, his service, a, a valuable award for what he did during that, that period because uh, he stepped up to the plate in the absence of, of, of his manager. Um, and I think that that needs to be to be recognised uh, in in these circumstances. Um, also, a, a name check for, for for Keith Leslie, uh, who was one of our senior VHOs and, and who moved across to manage the TTP service at the Newport level for the best part of of two years and did a fantastic job. So again, a mention for him. Uh, and also then for for John Keane and, and Matthew Cleveland. John Keane, um, who was our principal EHO and, 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 and the, the commercial manager, was seconded to, to Torvine to, to manage the, the Gwent response to, to T, TTP. So, uh, you know, Rhys Thomas have stepped up in, in, in John's absence, but both of them were at the forefront, really, of, of managing that, that TTP service uh, and the coordinated response to environmental health across the whole of the, the Gwent region. So it's a special mention for, for them. Uh, and finally, then Matthew Cridlin's team of training standards and licensing officers who are responsible with the police for enforcing the regulations, uh, encouraging businesses with their uh, with their risk assessments and, and, and compliance arrangements. Um, so, you know, without them, we couldn't have effectively dealt with the pandemic in, in, in the way that we did. So I think this is the single biggest achievement for the service area in the last 12 months was that response to the, the COVID pandemic and the move then to the uh, the recovery phase as we came out of, of, of that and, and actually trying to get back to some degree of, of normality. Um, and some of the measures that we put in place during that, that initial period um, at the response phase, we will actually now refine and carry through to the uh, to the next phase. Um, for example, I mean, some of the measures that licensing put in place for, for regulating tables and chairs on the highway. When we, were, when we had social distancing in place, it was necessary to regulate regulate that. Well, going forward, that was a, 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 a key uh, improvement in terms of Newport retaining its uh, purple flag status, in terms of the uh, the nighttime economy and, and, and safer city centre. So some good came of it in, in, in that sense, and we were able to refine it and, and carry it forward. Um, and there were similar measures that we introduced during the, uh, the COVID uh, uh, response phase that we will now refine and, and carry forward. These remote meetings are a case in point. Uh, during COVID, we had to have a, a system for, for remote council meetings to keep people safe. Uh, now following May, this is about a hybrid meeting and about personal choice. Um, 
and that was a massive achievement in terms of the democratic services staff. Uh, not just in terms of technology, supported by, by Mark's team, and but also in relation, dare I say, to member training and development. Um, to train up you know, previously so 50 councillors in terms of, of, of remote meetings and the new intake of councillors in terms of these hybrid meetings uh, was a significant achievement. So again, I think that's that's something that the staff need to be need to be commended for. Um, because so many resources were devoted to, to COVID and some of these key priorities, um, you know, it, it's 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 almost sort of uh, expected that there will be an impact on, on other parts of the service and, 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 and that was recognised throughout. Because we've had a full staff of, of other work and reprioritised, then you would expect there to be some impact in terms of performance in, in, in those areas. And thankfully, if you look at this, this service plan, you know, in the whole, you'll see that there's still been a significant amount of, of good in, in performance and even improvements throughout that, that period. So I think that's that's a, a significant achievement just to maintain that level of performance against that backdrop of, of, of the COVID response. But as I say, there are impacts there. Uh, and from a head of service point of view, um, I don't think that's a bad thing because I think it means that the targets that we've got in the service plan remain challenging. You know, if, if, if I came to you today and we were still showing a, a sea of green there uh, and meeting targets easily, despite having to put all the resource into into the COVID response and recovery, I think you'd be challenging me to say those those scrutiny targets are not are not taxing enough. We're not we're not doing enough. So to a certain extent, it just shows that when we have to reprioritize other work, there will be an impact on on some areas of the service, and we we flagged those up in, in in the service plan. And that legacy in terms of, of the backlog of work that built up during that period will carry forward into this year and, and, and next year by the time that we we deal with those those backlogs. Um, your particular areas of, of, of backlog include the, um, the food inspections for public protection, which will be a challenge for uh, public protection going forward. Uh, we have to inspect food premises in terms of food hygiene and food standards. Now, there has been a backlog in terms of those inspections over the past sort of few years, as we put environmental health offices into TTP and, and the COVID response, and, and, and licensing offices have been dealing with enforcement. So you would expect those those inspections to 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 fall by the wayside and for there to be a, a backlog. Now, in terms of the recovery plan, we've agreed that with the Food Standards Agency. So we're well on track in terms of getting those food inspections back and prioritise according to risk. So the highest risk premises we will inspect first and, and uh, we will deal with that backlog first. But it will probably take two to three years, I think, to get back to what it was pre-COVID. I say in the... Um, in the summary, we've got about 1,500 licensed food premises, you know, various types, various sizes and shapes throughout, throughout Newport. Uh, there's a significant amount of work there in terms of, of, of that backlog. Um, the only one red performance indicator that's showing on the service plan is in relation to local land charging. It was something you mentioned, Chair, earlier. Um, where we're only doing about 79% so of, of searches within five days. These are the property searches that we uh, we carry out and we provide property information in relation to land sales, uh, land transfers in, 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 in the area. Um, like I said, normally we would expect to turn around about 95, 98% of those searches within five days. It simply hasn't been possible during this time. Uh, for a while, uh, they were suspended completely. Uh, we couldn't allow people in physically to inspect the registers uh, and that added to the, the backlog. 80% is still a good performance, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's not as good as we would have, we would have liked. Again, we'll look to recover that next year, but you mentioned the ongoing project in terms of transferring the data. Uh, the land registry in, in, in Swansea is keen to, to centralise all the property data. So all of the records that each of the local authority holds uh, they want to centralise uh, It's part of, of the, the electronic conveyancing process in future where people will do searches online and it will speed up the, uh, the information. Um, so that will take time and that will hamper um, how quickly we can deal with the backlog in that area. But like I said, 80% of searches within that, that, that working week is, is not a, a high risk area for us and it's something that we can, we can work on. Um, a couple of other issues 
arising from, from that period. Birth registrations, uh, in terms of births, deaths and marriages, they were suspended for a, a long period during COVID. And at one stage last year, we had a six month waiting list for people to actually register births in the so again, that's a challenge going forward in terms of, of catching up with, with, with that. Uh, also the coroner service, we manage the coroner service on behalf of the whole of, of Gwent, all five authorities in Gwent, in partnership with the police and the, um, the chief coroner's office. And because we had restrictions in terms of coroner's inquest during that period, there's a backlog now in terms of, of inquests uh, for deaths in, in, in the Gwent area. Uh, we're up to 12 months now instead of a standard six months. That's of concern uh, and it's something we're addressing by appointing uh, additional area and assistant coroners to help with the uh, the backlog. We've got funding from the other Gwent authorities and the police to deal with that, so we're looking at appointing additional support for the Gwent coroner to deal with uh, to deal with those particular inquests. Um, so in terms of, of, of next year, very much uh, more of the same in terms of addressing those those particular issues and those those backlogs. A lot of the work that we do, as you'll see in the service plan, it's a bit like painting the fourth bridge. It's a recurring issue. It's not a task and finish, you know, start and end project for us. It's a continuing thing, whether it's scrutiny support or member support, uh, refining the constitution and your policies and procedures uh, and training and development for members. It's a continuing process. So next year, more of the same. And we think it'll be more of a budget challenge than it's been this year. The one good thing in terms of COVID, it's been a period of relative budget stability for us, largely because of the COVID hardship plans. Um, and that's why we're showing an underspend against the, the service area budget for, for last year. Now that's not going to continue. The hardship fund is not going to be very longer, as Miley will, will tell you, and, and, and therefore in future that will be a challenge because we feel that perhaps we're being squeezed from both sides really in terms of, of budget pressures and the need to deliver savings. Uh, on the other hand, increased demands because of new legislation coming out from, from Welsh Government and, and increased demand for our services. So we've always got that dilemma in terms of reconciling those two, two conflicting uh, priorities really. So that will be the challenge going forward. Um, finally, and I mentioned it in my, in my summary, um, it would be remiss of me not to mention the work of the, the former councillor, Ray Truman, uh, as a cabinet member, who for many years uh, over was responsible for overseeing this particular portfolio. And he was a great support to us over the years. So I just wanted to say a personal thank you to, to, to Ray Truman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> I'd like to thank yourself and the rest of the team for supporting the residents in Newport. Throughout the pandemic, it was uh, really stressful for some people, and you've got us through us. Um, you know, thank you very much for that. Um, would any members like to raise any comments? Yes, John. No, thank you for the report, but it's, it's something that uh, is a free for me, but it's acronyms like MTFP, FSA, LNR, HMLR. Is it a glossary of acronyms that are used? Oh, sorry, we, yeah, we, we, we will come around to that at, at some stage in, in terms of, of, of using English. Yeah, uh, yeah it, I'm sorry about that. Uh, MTFP is the, the, the medium term financial plan. Now you will explain that to you, it's the long term budget. Um, HMLR, Her Majesty's Land Registry, HMLR. Um, what were the other ones you mentioned? Uh, FSA. Sorry? FSA. Food Standard Agency. Thank you. That was the um, the recovery plan I mentioned in terms of the, the food hygiene inspection. And L and R. Law and regulation. Law regulation. Says right. we, there's only two. Okay. <laughs> right, I'm sure there's more in the, in the uh, yeah, as well. Sorry, it yeah. is something we have picked up. I do apologise for yeah, that. Yeah, that's not just a jargon and, and, and an acronym. Yeah, it's not just yourself, but I mean, other yeah. departments as well. When you write reports, uh, Absolutely. Even if you do use an acronym, in the first time you use it, put what it means in the first time you use it. Yeah, take that comment on board. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll, thank, thank you very you. much. Any other members got any comments? Mm. Thomas. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Just a question here. I'm, I'm not, maybe I missed the reference to here. Um, but we obviously are aware that the um, environmental health team were actually taken, most of them were seconded over to the track and trace service, weren't they? 
So are they back again yet? Uh, or what proportion of them are back again? And how are we, are we you know, what, how do you anticipate you know, what is going to happen in the future on that one? They, they would all second it. A uh, significant number wouldn't. We have to keep a core number of staff back just for the uh, the key strategy services such as housing inspections and so on. So we couldn't sit on them all to uh, the test and trace. Uh, yes, they're all back now, um, more or less. We're, uh, we're, we're phasing out the current uh, went TTP uh, arrangements and there'll be a new regional test trace protect scheme probably from uh, the autumn, uh, we think managed by by Kifili. it'll be a joint a joint service. But our staff will then come back. Um, gradually, as it's been phased down since we moved out of the uh, the, uh, the, the the COVID recovery, the uh, response phase, and when, as soon as we went to uh, alert level zero, as it as it were, we started to pull them back. So it, it wasn't. It was a sort of phased withdrawal, if if you like, over the last sort of six months or more. So more or less, most of the environmental health, health team are now are now back in um, back operating um, and, and catching up on on things like the uh, the food hygiene inspections. So one thing I should have said, so in terms of staffing, um, there is a recruitment and retention problem. It's it's a common problem across the council. It'll be mentioned in other in other service plans as well. It's something that we're looking at corporately in terms in terms of conditions of employment. But it's a particular issue in environmental health. What happened during COVID was you know, the stock of environmental health offices rose quite dramatically. They were in, 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 in quite in, uh, high demand and they remain in high demand, so post COVID. So we're competing for, for qualified EHOs now, not just with other councils, but with Public Health Wales and other organisations that are trying to strengthen their, their environmental health um, staffing. So that will be a problem going forward. I know, you know, John Keane in particular is looking at um, our own graduate program for training environmental health officers from within the council to try and help with that, that retention and recruitment problem. Yeah, that's so that's yeah, the, the staff coming back is probably less of an issue than keeping them yeah. um, and making sure that we've got a proper, properly resourced, um, the well qualified staff of environmental health yeah. officers. In a, certainly in, in my own ward of Scoville, because we have the highest number of uh, house of multiple occupation, we were aware that those routine inspections were going ahead at one stage. So there was a great relief when they were inspected. Um, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's possibly only coming into a role like this year to take on board the value which is in our house and say uh, environmental health officers. You know, they do a remarkable piece of work, and I actually think it would be a really interesting career if I were 40 years younger. <laughs> I think it's only when they're not there you realise the importance of the work that they actually carry out, you know, including the, the houses and multiple occupation inspections. Um, I and mean, we didn't stop it all together. Clearly, if they were at real high risks to, to health and safety, then we would still go in and carry out that, that work, but there were sort of routine inspections that we simply couldn't carry out because some of the housing agents were being seconded to, to TGP and, uh, and the environmental health support for, for care homes in some of the, the vulnerable settings. So, um, yeah, it's only when they're not there, I think you suddenly realise just how important the work is. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Ricks, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, just picking up on what you said there about the issues with um, a sort of retaining staff, certainly with the environmental health officers. Is this an area that can be worked on collectively then with the, the rest of the council to to recruit sort of apprentices and sort of grow our own own talent, as it were? Yes, I know. Reese might want to come in later in terms of or Kevin in terms of what we're doing corporately, because it is an issue across the board for the council, you know, recruitment and retention of staff, and we are looking at, at, at revised terms and conditions and the package that we offer staff anyway as part of that. But you're quite right, your apprenticeships and tra your internal training is one of the way that, ways in which you can develop your own EHOs and certainly is something that we're looking at in terms of not just graduates, but, but in terms of, of, of training people up from scratch in terms of environmental health officers. The challenge then is keeping them and retaining them once yes, they are yeah. qualified and finding substantive jobs for them on the structure that's affordable. 
you know, with, within your available budget. So there should be a lot that we're doing corporately, and, and we may want to come in on that to, to deal with the uh, the recruitment and retention problem. Yeah, I, I, I mean, indeed, I the Tracy came in on it, but I, I think it's an important point to say that, um, you know, having sat on a, a, a local government association um, discussion with, you know, local authorities in England, Wales, a couple of weeks ago, the recruitment and retention is a, an issue for the public sector at the moment, not, not just New York City Council, certainly not just, you know, environmental health. I think the, the, the pandemic has shifted. Um, people's expectations. So it is a challenge. Unrolls and roles like environmental health, and you know, Myron would talk about technical roles within the Myron service and technical roles within the city services, etc. You know, are a real challenge for us across the piece. Um, so you know, we've got a series of, of things in place, which I'm sure Tracy and Kevin could, could talk about some of the corporate corporate approaches to that. Yeah, just to pick up, I suppose, on the three areas you mentioned, we we have got an entry points um, sort of program ongoing at the moment, which includes the apprentice schemes that I've already talked about. Um, plus we have um, the graduate program that we've already got in place. Um, and we've got another graduate starting in September. Um, and also we're looking at um, our uh, merging leaders as part of our entry points across the council to try and build leadership capacity as well as technical professional capacity. Um, and also the final one is trying to offer um, with the PSB, the, the Public Service Board around um, with experience placements to try and get people into the organisation to understand you can work for the public sector and the different opportunities that are available here. Mm -hmm. um, and also to pick up what Gareth said, we're working with John Keane and a couple of other managers across the service to develop those specific graduate programs and traineeships in their area. So there's a mix of graduates and traineeships depending on which role we're looking at. Um, and there's potentially you know, five, five roles potentially across the organisation we can offer there as well. Can I just say, Chair uh, Councillor, it's also a really important equalities issue. So one of the other things we've noticed is our need to represent the communities we serve better and through normal recruitment, you know, like attracts like and we just get similar people. So growing our own, um, bringing in younger people, bringing in people from different communities is also part of that work. So that ties in really nicely with the apprentice and the talent management. <coughs> Yes. How competitive are, are, are the offers in the Buckingham City? So, how likely are you to be successful in bringing somebody in? Um, so, we'll, go, we'll stick with the HO because we cover the HO quite a bit. How, if you, if you post a job at it, uh, how likely are you to, to retain a suitable candidate if they're not if they're looking and they're not posted by somebody else? Did I go to Kevin, Kevin might want to come into this. So, um, in comparison to other local authorities or neighbouring local authorities, there, there may be differences with some roles, but it won't be it won't be a huge difference. In this particular issue, um, do our salaries compare favourably with public health wells? No, no, not not at all. Uh, do they compete favourably in the private sector? No, and that would be across the piece. So, you know, we, we had a pretty earlier conversation where we got IT services delivered by shared resource service, and they they are, have significantly significant difficulties in recruitment and retention of IT staff. But since the pandemic, those staff can essentially work for any organisation across the world from the universe. So, you know, we we will always. Unless we have a significant change in our pay structure, which is, you know, again, to come back to affordability, we're going to struggle across a series of those, those areas of work. Hence, the, the reason for looking at apprenticeship programs, traineeship programs, graduate programs, and we'll probably have to have a level of acceptance within that, and we will have people for a few years, and they will move on to a better paid opportunity elsewhere. Um, because that is probably the only way of resolving the, the issues of own resourcing in the short to medium term. If you look at various roles, they would be social service roles, for instance, social social workers tend to be very similarly paid across across the authority. There will be differences um, with other roles. Um, 
you know, we're probably not as competitive as, as we'd like to be with, with a number of us. But, but in this instance, if there's, a, if there's another external organization which is not a local authority that can offer the same model, probably they'll, they'll, they'll pay better. The two recommendations overall might not be as obvious favorable, but generally the, the pay will be better. You mentioned the short and medium term plan, which I don't think is a great plan. To be with you. I'm an steel worker, so I'm very short, which, so I know how you do it with our graduates. We would train them up really, really well, and then as soon as they could, they would jump ship and go somewhere else. So I know that, that that's quite a big problem. Could you come back to us with, with what your long term strategy is? How we're going to how we're going to try and close some of these problems because it's only going to be all we could all we do at the moment. What you just said is we've got a plan to close a gap, which is then going to come back again to close a gap, which is then going to come back again to close a gap, which is then going to come back again. How do you think that we're going to be able to close that gap significantly and then keep it closed? Um, well, I, I, my suppose uh, there isn't really a long there isn't really a long term plan because the long term plan would be um, a complete revamp of the pay structure and increasing those those pay ranges which are not affordable at the moment. So actually, the only option we've got is to get people in early, train them up, have them for a period of time, accept that they're going to move on to something else. And restart that process because the alternative is not having an MBA at all. And, and that's the situation we've been in for a number of these roles for a few years now. So it isn't there isn't a magic wand for this one. The reality is we, we do not compete for those technical jobs with other organizations. Could we have some paper of you guys then which shows what you need? I thought I do you may well have already done it, shows what you need and then of how we could help to get us that yeah. We could, uh, we could have a look at something going the work program, look at that actual comparative pay pay grades across the phase. If, if the committee wanted to look at that, it's within your remit. Um, it just seems that we're on the hamster wheel, yeah. and it seems to be, yeah, that, yeah. We seem to be we're accepted that we're going to stay on this hamster <coughs> wheel and we're not going to get off it. I, I, I agree, but for for a look, I suppose what I would say back is for a local authority, it, you know, the generation of additional income in order to pay for increased wages is not is not as easy to do as a, as a private sector organisation, because actually we can't increase the cost of things really, because actually most of the stuff that we get that is funded is funded by Welsh government at a particular rate, and we are hiring the company to about finance at the moment, so it's. You know, the, the ways of resolving that, you know, the increase in salaries is a real challenge for us. Actually, what we need to do is increase the rate of people coming in and, and some level of acceptance around that. But I would say, you know, we have a huge turnover of staff. We have the difficulties in some areas across the organisation, not across the police. Um, and people are not always motivated just by the bottom, bottom line of the money they make, you know. People come into the public sector for a reason, and a lot of that is to do with you know, public service. And we are looking at the range of other terms and issues as well, which we've got more flexibility about things like leave and flexi and flexible approaches to work, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all attractive as well. So we need to look at the package, but yeah, we certainly have a look at the package. That's okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Moving on back to the review, can I go to page seven and eight? If members have got any comments to put to officers, please say. Nine and ten. Eleven and twelve. Can I ask that you put the numbers on the side of the page as well, please? Sorry, Councillor Harris, what's that? Um, I got page 71 for page 10. Ah, uh, yes, there's two different numbers on these pages. Yeah. I'm looking at the ones at the bottom, and yeah, it's page 72 and 73 to you, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, you okay with that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I go on the 70, 74 to 75. 76 to 77, 78 to 79, 
page 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. Councillor Riggs, would you like to come in, please, and say which page you're on? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm on page 89, but my other laptop has just decided to restart itself, so I'll, I'll try and um, paraphrase this as best I can. Um, yeah, I'm looking at page 89. It's it's um, point 15. Uh, it's about the the landlord's response for for EPCs. Um, we've got a, a figure that 229 landlords have not responded to requests for confirmation of EPC. Um, so really, that's sort of that's a little bit unacceptable given the amount of um, sort of um, private rented accommodation we've got out there. So I just wanted to ask what steps um, are going to be in place to ensure that these landlords do respond and confirm they have the relevant uh, documentation in place. Thank you, Councillor Riggs. Which officer would like to take that? I'll, I'll, I'll reply to that. It, 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 um, it's one of those enforcement issues that's probably being put on the back burner while we've been dealing with the COVID response, if, if, if truth be told. Okay. Um, because it wasn't a high, a high priority when, when you're looking at some of the other more important environmental health and, and trading standards issues. But you're quite right. Obviously, now we've we, we've moved from that and we've got more resources back to, to deal with those issues. We will escalate it. Ultimately, they can be prosecuted for not providing the information. So we, we will take action as per our usual enforcement process, issue a number of warnings. If they if they fail to, to provide the information, we can and will prosecute. Thank you, Mr. Price. Councillor Ricks, are you happy with that? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm happy with that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Page 90. 91, 92, <clears throat> 93, 94. <clears throat> Everyone happy with that? Yes. <clears throat> Come now to the finance service. Yes, thank you. Officers, thank you very much for your input. It's well appreciated. Thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. I don't recognise everybody by name. Would the officers like to introduce themselves, please, to the members? Thank you, Major. Um, I'm William Rushworth, and I'm the Council's Head of Finance. So that, that includes revenues and benefits this year, uh, interim audits, procurement, accountancy. I'm Dan Zuber, I've been here already. Uh, Reese Cornwall, not to be confused with Reese Thomas, who can have a season for his own. Reese Cornwall, direct report services. Uh, Rob Green, assistant head of finance, relatively new to me, but I've been around just over a year. Um, my main responsibility is for the accounting systems. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Meek, I'm the procurement and payments manager in finance. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Andrew Waffle, which you've been doing all the time. Chair, apologies for Emma Johnson, who now need, but she, uh, she currently heads up the revenues um, section. Uh, so we'll, we'll be some new calls, I'm sure. Thank you all. Welcome. Would you like to um, give your report? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, Last year, 2022, was another 
uh, challenging year. Obviously, COVID was still was still around. We were like we were either working hybridly or we were working at home fully. Uh, things changed throughout the last twelve those 12, 12, 12 months. You may think that corporate services is a back office function, and it is. But during COVID, um, we've seen certain parts of the finance service absolutely at the front end of supporting communities and businesses. So uh, even in the second full year of COVID, which lastly was the revenue team was still making uh, rates, uh, rebates and adjustments to businesses. It was still administering um, business rates related COVID grants to businesses um, and the accountancy team, for example, was still uh, administering uh, a significant amount of monthly claims against what's going to be had to So, in particular, the uh, revenues team and also the benefits team who are in the service now, um, they were very much at the front end of supporting individuals and also businesses with the various sort of national um, support mechanisms that were in place last year. This year, just as a kind of Katrina, that is still the case. So this year, the benefits team and the revenues team are still the forefront. So the cost of living supports that we that we now got, that is the revenue team that is administering all of all of that. So yes, it's a back office function, but during the COVID period, it absolutely been at the uh, at the front end of of supporting um, our community. That has meant that there's been a, a knock on effect on the uh, on the core work, um, and then there is a bit of catch up catching up stuff to do now as well. In terms of the in terms of the service though, um, uh, following the management's restructure that both um, Gareth and also Tracy described, in finance, nothing has left finance, but we've had the benefit service join us. Uh, that, that, is, that used to be in finance for, for, for a few years ago. Again, the revenues and the benefit service tends to be a combined service. Um, and, so, and we also had customer services that have also joined finance as well. So we are working through what that means now and how that fits in and how. Um, but last year, um, lots of successes in terms of the COVID support, as I just described, and as my reports said, you know, 20 million pounds worth of, of business rates relief, 700 COVID grants. Uh, to businesses nearly at two million pounds um, and a very significant sort of 24 million pounds worth of, of hardship fund claims made administered by the uh, by the accountancy teams in particular a successful year uh, relative to the uh, uh, challenges that we set ourselves in, in the service plan we didn't meet the pis uh, on some audits for the for the reasons set out in the reports because we have, we have some unexpected long-term staff uh, Ill, illnesses and the uh, where we normally go to for external resources to to help out on the audit plan they were struggling themselves so we just didn't have the manpower however the chiefs and auditors were still able to provide an overall assessment on the council's Control environments, they did sufficient amounts of work to enable that, that to happen. Um, also, some challenges on council tax uh, as well, as you might, might imagine, coming out of the COVID period. And obviously, that's still continuing now as we've got our cost, cost of living um, challenges uh, uh, as well. But beyond that, though, um, most of our PIs were met. And um, we progressed on nearly all of our objectives. Um, we are still getting bogged down in a couple of our digital um, projects around um, the self-service of our revenues um, and that is coming to an end slowly but surely and a UK government's initiative on council tax was also held up their end um, and that's also been delayed but on most of our other objectives we were able to progress those uh, as we as we as we plan them so we will obviously be catching up on those now in our new um, service plan that we're now kind of putting together um, and you know I, as i look forward 
Um, clearly, all services, those included, have got a new way of working, a, a new normal to get used to. Sometimes that can be challenging, you know, so, so audits, for, for example, we're used to meeting staff, getting records, etc., etc. That is clearly different now. So we are just kind of finding find our feet as to how that kind of works. Um, and I think the cost of living issue, which has now maybe overtaken COVID, um, has bring, is bringing its own challenges to the bells and bends in terms of supporting our payments, also collecting revenues as well, which it's early days, but we are seeing some pressure there as well. Uh, again, you wouldn't be surprised with you. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Chair. That's my summary. Happy to take questions and the team are here to uh, go through some of the detail as you work. Thank you, Mary. I've got one comment to make on the cost of living thing. You recently sent out letters to residents. Um, an old age pensioner lives across the road from me. Kevin knocked my door today to ask for help. He's got no access to the internet, which is what you're going to find with a lot of the old age pensioners. Um, so I had to send an email to yourselves on his behalf and, um, to get a paper thing, which I had a reply in about an hour, which was very good. So thank you for that. Thank you, Shay. Yeah, we've, I, I received, you know, not many, but a number of emails from councillors on behalf of their uh, constituents and you know we've been able to resolve those within 24 hours normally um, and that's been well well received all, all around so um, I, you know the cost of living 55,000 individual payments uh, are being made and we're already at, on, on over 40,000 uh, the first 30,000 was done within within a few few days because they were the direct debit payers. So we had their bank details, therefore it was very quick to sort of uh, well, to get, to get those done. So well, it's been, team. Yeah, and anyway, uh, isn't 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 here here you know, but, but I'll pass on uh, pass on your uh, your words there. Um, so it's, it's like most things, you know, you can get up to a certain point quite, quite quickly. And it's really difficult to get those last bit done and we're at that point now, the last sort of 10,000 or so payments, we've written to everybody again and say, well, we think you're due a cost yes. of living, um, but we haven't received an application or there's something that you've not sent, sent in that we've already requested, get them in because there is a, a, a limit, mm -hmm. a time limit on this. So, um, but we've made some good progress and we're, we're nearly there, but it's getting difficult. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, Chancellor. Just fifty-five thousand. That's a huge proportion of the houses yeah. in Newport, isn't it? When you're looking at the criteria for the cost of living payments, and then you map that on to the people on our council tax system that fitted that criteria, it, it was fifty-five thousand individual payments. Um, so, but we're on forty-three-ish thousand. Uh, at this time, so I get an update every every Friday. So mm -hmm. we're it's, it's just really sobering yeah. how many yeah. people are going to be put into hardship because of this. Yeah. And yeah. um, sorry, Chair, that was simply an extra one there just for clarification, really. And I could have answered this at any point in this, but uh, raised it earlier on. Um, the risk assessments. Um, I do, I do remember, you know, coming across risk assessments, obviously an audit, but I was wondering, you know, on your particular one, Mary, um, the, the, you know, how, are they shifting a lot at the moment? Are there many unpredictables? Are you having to change your assessment of the risks? Are they going up? Are they going down? Are you seeing ones coming in off field which you hadn't thought of before? So uh, our area of financial management, we've actually reduced that, 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 that risk. Um, obviously, as we get into the year and our financial forecasts have become, become clearer, mm -hmm. then that might change, but that one has, has come down. The others have stayed more or less, as I was saying, nothing's increasing, uh, but that one has actually decreased. Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other members like to make comments? Yeah. Can I move to the report, then, please? Am I going to take it page by page, please? indicate if you want to speak. 
Um, we're going for the page number at the bottom of the page, which is 102, 103, 104, 105. Councillor Ells, would you like to come in, please, and indicate which page? Ah, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, page 104, just going back a page, I didn't come in fast enough. Do apologise. Um, on the top line on the workforce planning um, section, there, there's a um, issue around sort of transactional processes and resources, um, sort of linked, I think, to the My Council services and the My New Board app and what can be sort of streamlined and processed. It's at 10% uh, with a green light. We're sort of more than halfway through the time scale, given it was started in 21 and due to finish in March 23. So I'd expect that to be 50% rather than 10% if we're sort of more than halfway through. And the, the same thing appears to be possibly a repetition a couple of pages down um, on page 108, where it's a very similar uh, sort of measure, which is a 10% in the number. So I wanted to sort of query the differences in the two, if we can. Yeah, so on, on the first one, uh, which is the 10% on, which is, which, which is green, that's, that's linked to what I was talking earlier about. We're, we're getting a bit stuck on some of our self self service um, projects in revenues. So that's in two part really. This relates to the second part. So the first part is where we are enabling the system to facilitate self self service, and that one is nearly there, uh, but it's bogging us down a bit. And that's a technical issue there. And this one is then the, the impact of that on the structure of the team and their operating model. Because obviously the IT system is just a box of tricks. It's how we then work around it and with it that, that we then need to look at and do. We've done some work on that already, hence the 10%. The, the but until we finish the first one, we can't actually, and then focus on getting people to engage with it and to do the self-service. We can't work on the second one, but it's green because it's where we want, it's where we expect it to be. That is, it comes after that first aspect, um, and that's why that's green. The amber one, just remind me again which one that was. Page 108, on the bottom page numbers. So it's a similar one in terms of review of working practice and staffing requirements around routine transactions. Yeah, so yeah. so that probably is uh, with apologies. That's that's exactly the same the same thing. So um, you know that that doesn't give us a huge amount of concern at this point, with the exception of the fact is we'd like to get on with it. Um, but yeah, so apologies. There is some there is some inconsistencies there, but they are one of the same thing. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for that. You okay with that, Councillor Hales? Will we know? Yeah, that, that's fine, thanks, Chair. <coughs> Page 109, 110. Councillor Reeks, would you like to come in? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just wanted to pick up on page 110. Uh, we've got the point there about the upgrading the financial system. And uh, it's something that was obviously put to new councillors when we came on board about uh, with our laptops, etc. that um, everything had to stay on that laptop. laptop. We couldn't migrate the, the data to mobile phones or iPads, etc. for reasons of, uh, of security. Yet one of the things that you're actually uh, potentially um, championing is having the ability to access systems on multiple platforms such as mobile phones and tablets, i.e. to authorise orders on the go. Now, where does the uh, where does your department stand with this? Because obviously you do have some very sensitive information there that um, if, if it's on a personal mobile, etc., that, that falls in the wrong hands, it's going to cause problems. Obviously, you know, Within the, the council as a whole, we're looking to keep everything as safe and secure as uh, as we possibly can. Can we answer that? Yeah. Go ahead. So, not this is from a techie side of it, not from a finance side of it. So, um, 
obviously, you know, the, you, as part of the induction, it would have gone through your sort of data training. So it's also something who we had this conversation about earlier on, right, about the importance of managing data. Mm -hmm. uh, from an access of systems point of view, so just uh, explain what this would be. So there, there are ways of doing that in a, in a safe way. So we're doing some piloting work on bring your own device at the moment. Um, you might see in various papers, sorry, councillor, BOYD will be the, you might see something, but bring your own, BYOD, bring your own device. So if you see that anyway, that's what that means. Um, and we steered clear of that for security reasons up until recently, but we, we're piloting something called Company Portal at the moment. So I've got it on my, my personal phone as a, as a bit of a pilot, and it segregates on your device the access to those systems. So it doesn't store any data on your device, but it allows you access essentially a portal into the system that you're operating from. Should, should you lose the device, that could be wiped remotely by IT. So actually it takes away. So there are, at the moment, that's an aspiration. So for instance, if you see uh, within city services primarily, when they're doing jobs, they maybe, you know, sort of ground maintenance work or, or refuse collection, they use tablets and that logs. That's, a camp, that's an organisational tablet, mm -hmm. which links back to those systems. So we can do it through that. And that could be a way of doing some of the work with finance. But actually, there are ways of doing it on multiple devices safely. But again, we're in a pilot phase for that. At the moment, I think this priority, as far as the, the, the service plan is concerned, is, is the delivery of that finance system. So yeah. that's going to be by next April, Myron. Yeah. Yeah. So we're some way away from having that in place at the moment. The, the new system will, will uh, allow this facility to be available if the organisation chooses to actually um, go down that 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 road um, so you know we won't we won't be able to deliver that access issue you know just because of that single project that will be an organizational um switch uh, effectively so um, but we are developing the system with that with that ability in, in mind as and when or if and when it becomes available OK, so in your opinion, then you don't think there'd be any issues with uh, being uh, sort of targeted with ransomware or anything like that if it's used on sort of uh, third party devices, as it were. There's always there's always a risk. And, and once we get to the point where we've got the finance system in place, uh, we'll do a data impact assessment on it to understand whether we think that risk is worthwhile considering the benefits of being able to access it from multiple devices. Um, as far as data is concerned, we, we, we err on the side of data risk caution with any of those decisions. So we've been, we've been piloting this, this company portal access for about eight months now. And we're still working through whether we think that the security levels on her uh, are okay or not. So it gives us the capability. We will need to make the business decision whether about we think that the, the risk of viable. As I said earlier on, the, the, the single point of failure of the individuals involved in it, and I don't mean that in a harsh way about, about people, but the, the reality we can put whatever system we want in place. But you know, if an individual there's things outside of those policies that it, it can cause a problem. Obviously, from our side, we try to reduce the possibility of that happening as much as we much as we possibly can. But we're it's like an arms race. You know, we are we are putting in, implementing systems and processes, and the people who want to steal your data are implementing systems and processes and and you know it's it's about keeping on keeping on top of that and managing the risk. Things like um, HR systems, so our HR system, we've already implemented that. So you can have an app on your phone, you can put your leave, you, you can do your sickness, you can put in your references, you can scan your documents when you're about to start working with us, you can do all that from your mobile phone. Because actually there's a minimal risk associated with that. Mm -hmm. We'll probably have a more, uh, you know, a longer term view of it when we're talking about our finance systems. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Thank you, Rhys. Rob, Reed, can you next? Yeah, it was just to add, add one extra thing. It is referenced here within the document, and the new system is a cloud-based system. 
So, I, you know, I'm no IT expert but by any stretch, but obviously we won't be hosting this ourselves. So that does, I guess, just put a slightly different dimension in terms of that data security. And, and as Naim said earlier, the kind of the mobile access is something that we can work with the supplier in order to configure as we need it and, and ultimately determine what we do or don't allow via a mobile device. So it's just to hopefully give a little bit more reassurance in, in terms of our approach to this and, and you know, obviously taking that, that issue particularly seriously. Thank you. Councillor Reynolds? I think you must have left on because you just preempted my question to be honest. Um, it, it was more of a point of clarification rather than a question, but I think you just answered it. Um, in terms of the data that's, I mean, let's say for argument's sake, I was to access my laptop data on my mobile. What you're saying basically is that via the cloud, I can access that data via a third party app, but I wouldn't actually have the data on this phone. So if this phone was stolen or it had ransomware, as Councillor Leeds mentioned, downloaded on it, uh, it would be my data at risk, but not the stuff that's on this laptop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Essentially, that there's nothing stored on, you know, as you save stuff to your hard drive, there's nothing stored on those, there's nothing stored on that. They're essentially just windows into through a network point into our systems. And whether that's a server that we own or it's a server provided by the provider of, well, of the system and it's being in cloud, you know, it, it doesn't matter. If, if your device started because we have got systems in this, if your device started um, to do things that the network felt was at risk, so I started encrypting files, it would lock you out of the network. You know, right? So, you know, there are series of uh, mitigation devices, but that's what you need to think about. It. These are essentially just a window into you know, whatever system it is. And then presumably there was a problem, the access that I would have via this mobile as you said, could be deleted remotely from. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've got a system. In, we've got a. Uh, if you read the Information Governance Report, which goes over the Security Management Committee, I think, um, in there is some stuff around it. Um, but essentially, it automatically it monitors the um, traffic on the network, and it would catch you up to the network. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. As long as it doesn't do anything dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, page 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115. Sorry, Chair. Um, page 114, is that regarding the COVID grants? I'm not sure which ones you're going on. I don't know again with the pages. Those look on the left. Um, 114, it's uh, distribute further business grants. Yeah, is that with the COVID grant? Does that cover the COVID yes. grants? Yes. Oh, yes, just a question. Sorry, just a question then. Um, regarding the COVID grants, um, how have we fared off with uh, any fraudulent claims and how are we progressing with um, getting those back? If um, any. Yeah, so sorry, going to the care and interest because I have COVID grants for my business. Or oh, I just just put it on my Yes, yeah, should, should that have been on the decorations? That is on yeah. all that is on my scarf at the end. Okay, okay. Sure. we'll put that through to Mr. Price. Thank you. So we did um, we did run uh or in to Lordis ran some some fraud checks on all applications. Uh, both in the first year, I believe the second year as well, uh, done by a third party, but Andrew can maybe expand on that. Yeah, sure. So for all COVID 2021, um, we were involved in anti-fraud checks. The system set up at Newport was quite robust and was well thought through. So the actually actual number of frauds identified was quite low, relatively low. Um, the one that we did identify, we referred to the police and the police are dealing with it. Um, the others uh, are minimal in terms of value. Um, from 21-22, um, we were not supported by the external provider and errors carried out their own anti fraud checks prior to um, <coughs> issuing the grants as, as much as possible in terms of undertaking reverse checks on the information that's been provided. 
um, to make sure the application is robust before we should do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. My business did accept or fulfill the criteria for a number of grants, and there were quite a lot of questions that, that came back. If something wasn't right, there was a, a number of questions and, and, and the requirements to achieve the final tech box were quite, I, they were quite strict and they were quite strict, quite stringent. It was, it was, um, I personally, I felt it was it was a lot more difficult to obtain a grant from the council than it was through the government. Councillor Reynolds. So I just I might have to uh, retrospectively declare it was just not uh, just in case. I just don't know. We now have a treasurer of a charity that also received COVID grants. So just in case, can we just check that, please? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. We will do. Okay, <laughs> we'll be now called out to the party main job. Okay, everyone happy? 115, 116, 117, 118, 119. 120. Yes, I'd like to invite all the officers if you'd like to go now. Thank you very much for your inputs. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very, very much for your ongoing work during COVID and whatever. It was a very challenging time for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so and this is part of the meeting where we just discussed what's going to happen so we can take comments and recommendations that we can fold on for the cabinet members and the um, head surface. So, um, for, so just advise the notes that I've um, taken. So in regards to the people and business change um, report, um, we've got um, Mark will check on um, Councillor Horton's query about if you were um, print off um, stuff from home, from the laptops, and um, make comment about, um, about the proactive approach um, with the e-learning as well. Um, Reese will run a, a report and get a final number of um, those working from home and what we are at now. And also comment on um, it was good that the council um, changed the approach to work um, connectivity, positive, um, positive result from COVID, that we worked um, smarter. Um, so, in regards to the people and business change report, was there any other comments or recommendations that you'd like me to make? Members, all happy with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. With um, law and regulations, we've got them um, in future reports. Um, they're ensure that the acronyms are included um, as a glossary, see if we can ensure this. But for other reports as well going forward, not only um, performance reviews. Thanks um, to the um, queried about the um, short term and medium plan that um, we said about um, the wages, whether we could um, have a report possibly on how we can get out of. Um, Another process of just so what to see if we can add something on the report. Just feel that it's just been accepted that this yeah. is a problem and it's a bit difficult, so we're not going to fix it. That's how it sort of that's how it feels. Yeah. So what we do um, during the August, we do meet them with the heads of service to discuss this draft plan or forward work program. Perhaps then we could discuss in the next meeting whether um, you know if the committee agreed to this, whether we can 
have the, have a, an agenda item to discuss this in future. And so, do you know what what would best practice look like? They might be to steal the idea from somebody else. Thank you very much, James. Sir. Um, is there any other comments and recommendations you might need to make for law and regulations um, report? No. Um, with uh, finance, just um, praising myself, Chair, um, about the email that you sent and got reply in 30 minutes, and also um, the fact that the team for the hard work they've done in uh, responding to all of the um, individual payments. Um, that's the only comment that I've taken from finance. Was there any particular comments or recommendations? Councillor Riggs, have you got any recommendations? Only really for the, the action plans uh, updating on the financial system and the specific fraud training I mentioned at the start of the meeting. Thank you for that. I've got that um, done. Thanks very much, Councillor Riggs. OK, thank you. Okay, and then um, just next on the agenda is um, the scrutiny advisor reports. Um, on page um, 127 of the pack, it's just that the actions that we've made, um, we've sent the comments and recommendations out to heads of service and um, cabinet members, uh, what we made two weeks ago. Um, we'll ch I haven't had no comments yet from the queries that we made. Um, First one for the uh, regeneration investment in housing, when we request information on the other options that the council will explore beside, uh, besides emergency accommodation. So um, I'll chase that with Tracy Brooks and also the query that the committee made for city services as well, when it asked for an action plan on how to um, um, get residents aware of the charging points. So I'll chase this up uh, for the committee and as soon as I get up, they are forward on as um, soon as possible. The uh, next two meetings, um, the first one is on the 12th of September. Um, currently still waiting for a topic at the moment. I imagine currently it'll be discussing the draft annual forward work programme. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I hear anything else, again, I'll email you immediately. And then on the 14th of November, it will be the mid-year performance reviews. I think currently at the moment, uh, we're still um, working with the performance team because uh, there's going to be a shift in focus on how we review performance and possibly more looking into how we use resources. But um, ongoing work at the moment, and um, as soon as we know anything, we'll let the committee know. But that's everything with my report chair. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you members for attending this meeting and for all your input into the meeting and comments. I call this meeting to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Sorry for the change of venue. Is it like old school like we used to do in committee room one? I like this.